Our next speaker is Dr. Martin Allen Auerbach from uh, UCLA Medical Center, where he's the uh, director of, neuro, of the um, nuclear medicine department and has been a close colleague and collaborator in To be closer to the mic? OK. OK. Uh, Dr. Um, Auerbach has been working extensively in gallium-68 dotatate imaging, and we've been working in close collaboration with him. And it's really a, a, an enormous uh, pleasure to be able to introduce him to talk to you about the subject of new types of imaging for neuroendocrine cancer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed, and hello, good afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the imaging aspect of neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, I know that uh, from personal experience with neuroendocrine patients, these are usually highly motivated, highly educated patients. So forgive me if I oversimplify things um, below the level of your, of your understanding and knowledge. With this. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to um, explain to you how we image neuroendocrine tumors, what types of scans we have available. Uh, since radiation is a big topic in the public um, press, I'll also talk a little bit about the risks of radiation. Uh, and then I'll go into how does imaging help us um, in terms of staging the disease, um, selecting patients for the PRT, the peptide radioreceptor therapy, and then also uh, how imaging helps in um, understanding whether the treatment that the patient is receiving is really effective. So I'll start with the imaging aspect here. So how do we image neuroendocrine tumors? Um, there's different types of, of imaging available. There is what we call anatomical imaging, which really shows us the structure of the tumor, um, the size, um, and where it sits anatomically. Uh, scans that are used for this purpose are CAT scans, or also known as CT, which work with x-rays, MRIs, which work with magnetic fields, and ultrasound, which works with sound waves. There is also uh, the aspect of molecular imaging. Now, molecular imaging doesn't show a structure. It really shows us function, how the tumor is functioning, what kind of characteristics it has on a molecular level. And the imaging modalities that we have available for that are called SPECT, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, and PET, sorry, which stands for Positron Emission Tomography. And then finally, in the last couple of years, there's been development of what we call fused imaging. Now, fused imaging is basically a combination of anatomical imaging and molecular imaging. So with one scan, we get information about structure and function. So what is anatomical imaging? As I mentioned, it um, usually works with x-rays, magnetic fields, or ultrasound, and it images structure. So for a, for a CAT scan, uh, we have a source that produces x-rays. These x-rays are sent through the body, and then there are detectors on the other side, and with the software of the computer, it creates an image. My job as a um, nuclear medicine physician or radiologist is to look at these images and write a diagnostic report for the referring physician. This is what a CAT scan looks like. This is looking at the body from the front. It's what we call a coronal, Im coronal image where we slice through the body like this. And you can see anatomical organs, the liver, the heart, the stomach. And if you would have a tumor, you would be able to pick that up anatomically. Now, molecular imaging um, uses radioactive tracers. And these radioactive tracers allow us to see what is happening inside the body and the cells at the molecular and, as I said, cellular level. The tracers that we have available for neuroendocrine tumors target the somatostatin receptors. If this is the tumor here, you have the somatostatin receptor, you have a somatostatin analog, and linked to that, you have a radioactive isotope. The um, somatostatin analog homes in on the receptor, binds to the neuroendocrine tumor cell, 
and the attached radiation leaves the body and is caught by special cameras, SPECT cameras or PET cameras, and then the software creates an image that I can look at and interpret. This is an example of a gallium dotatate scan. Dotatate is an octreotide analog. It's labeled with gallium-68, which is a positron-emitting isotope. You inject it into the body. An hour later, you take a picture with a PET scanner, and you get this type of image. Now, somatostatin receptors are not only present in tumor cells, they're also present in normal cells in your body. So some things that we see light up on a scan are not tumor, but just normal, um, uh, represent normal physiologic uptake in certain organs, as for example, uh, the pituitary gland, the thyroid gland, the liver, and the gut. But if we see something like this, we know this is not normal, so this represents a neuroendocrine tumor with a high receptor density taking up the tracer. Now, if we do fused imaging, as I said, we combine the structural and functional or molecular information. And uh, examples of such scanners are SPECT CT scanners, PET CT ca cameras, and then as a newer development, PET MRIs. And this is what a fused image would look like. In black and white, you can see the anatomical structure. And then in uh, yellow to red scale, you can see the molecular information of the somatostatin receptor distribution in the body. And you can see this large mass here that has a lot of uptake. So now I can not only say, um, is there uptake? I can also exactly say, where is the uptake? What organs are involved? Now, um, there's a lot of um, rumors, I should say. But uh, radiation has gotten a pretty bad rap in the, um, in the press. Um, so I'm here to, to um, defend radiation, at least when it comes to diagnostic and, and therapeutic purposes. So there are frequent patient concerns when I talk to patients about their scan that they're going to have. Uh, and the most frequent questions are usually, am I radioactive? Um, or as most patients put it, am I going to glow in the dark? Now, unfortunately, I have never ever seen a patient glow in the dark, although I think that would be a nice side effect to, uh, to bring home. <laughs> but um, given the low dose and, uh, and the short, relatively short half-life of the traces that we use, um, it is not dangerous. Um, many patients also ask whether they can be around children or pregnant women. And again, there's no problem um, with the low doses and, and the short half-life of our tracers that we give to patients. And then when you have a scan, um, after that you can eat anything you want, and you should drink a little bit more to flush out the kidneys. Just to put things into perspective, um, so the usual dose, if you would get a dotatate PET CT, would be about 2.5 rem. Rem is a, a measurement of, of radioactivity that the body gets exposed to. Um, and these are what's called risk models that are based on what is called a linear non-threshold model, assuming that there is no safe level of radiation. Uh, these numbers are based on observations of survivors from the uh, atomic bomb um, fallouts in, in Japan uh, during the Second World War. And from these models, it was calculated that if you receive a dose of 0 0.1 rem, your risk is about 0.004%. And as you increase the dose, the risk goes up but even with a dose of 10 rem, you can see that the relative risk of developing cancer from this radiation is only 0.4%. Now, this is, this is very abstract, right? So to put that into perspective, um, just by living on the Earth, we're exposed to radiation. If you live in the US, the annual background radiation is calculated at 0.72 rems. This radiation comes from outer space. It comes from radioactive materials that are in the ground. And some of it actually comes from medical imaging, which has been included in the annual background radiation calculation in the United States. So just by living on the Earth, um, we're exposed to radiation. And our bodies have evolved um, mechanisms to fix, to repair damage that is caused by radiation. So we have DNA repair mechanisms. So uh, the linear non-threshold model that was used to 
calculate these risks really is not appropriate because we are, just by, from an evolutionary standpoint, are able to fix damage that's caused by low-level radiation. Um, another uh, way of putting things into perspective is to look at the annual dose limit for radiation workers, such as somebody like me who works with radioactivity. I'm allowed to receive five rems per year during my uh, work at, um, in, in the nuclear medicine lab. Um, and then lastly, or most importantly, I should say, the lifetime risk of developing a fatal cancer is 20%. So if you put that into relation to these numbers here, you see that the actual increase in risk is almost negligible. Uh, what you also have to add is the information that you're getting uh, from the scan since you already have cancer, you're getting vital information to treat that cancer. So with all this together, the, the risk from radiation is really not, doesn't really play that much of a role. Did I sell you on that? <laughs> okay, how does imaging help us? Well, the most important part is probably staging and what we call restaging. So if you have, you're diagnosed with a neuroendocrine cancer and um, the first thing your oncologist and the team taking care of you, what they want to know is whether the disease is localized or whether it's spread. Because this will really determine the subsequent course of treatment. Now this is an example of a patient that was diagnosed with a pulmonary neuroendocrine tumor. Um, there was a high concern of metastatic disease because of the size. And uh, the patient then had a dotatate scan PET CT scan, and you can see that there's uptick here in the region of the right lung. This is what's called an axial images of the fused information. This is the right lung, this is the left lung, and here you can see this mass with significant dotatate uptake. Now, this patient didn't have any evidence of disease elsewhere, so despite the initial concern of metastatic disease being present, this patient is now a surgical candidate because there's only one lesion, and hopefully the patient will be cured by removing this lesion. Now, unfortunately, the other thing, the other uh, thing can also happen that you have a newly diagnosed patient, and the staging scan shows something like this, where you have extensive disease in the small bowel, and then also metastatic, extensive metastatic disease to the liver and uh, lymph nodes. So this information um, is um, important. Unfortunately, the patient is no longer a surgical candidate, but based on this information, a optimized treatment um, can be developed. Now, the other important information that we get from uh, the scans is um, the information about the somatostatin receptor density. So if you remember, for imaging, we have the somatostatin analog that's linked with an isotope, radioactive isotope that allows us to do imaging. Now, if we want to do treatment with radioactivity, we hook up the same molecule um, somatostatin analog, we hook it up with a radioactive isotope that decays by emitting damaging radiation on a very local, um, uh, just in a very local space, and that destroys the neuroendocrine tumor cells. Now, we can only do this treatment if we have evidence that there are enough receptors present, so this treatment um, device here can hook up to the, to, to the neuroendocrine tumor. So by doing imaging with a um, tracer that localizes somatostatin to somatostatin receptors, we can see either this, a patient that has high somatostatin receptor density, thereby would be a candidate for uh, the PRRT. And on the other scale, on the end, other end of the scale, you can see a patient where you don't, who has extensive uh, disease based on the anatomical imaging, but you don't see any uptake of the um, dotatate. So this patient would not be a candidate for PRT and would have to go to a different type of treatment. And then there are so, sort of patients that fall in between where you have uptake and um, usually the li degree of uptake in the liver is used to determine whether they are candidates or not candidates. Usually if uptake is at or above liver level, they, do, uh, they, do, they are candidates for the treatment and if it's below the uptake of the liver then they should have a different form of treatment. So if we treat somebody, we want to know whether it works or not. And imaging can help. Um, traditionally, the most um, 
used uh, measurement is size. And there's something that uh, radiologists call resist criteria. And some of you might have heard that. It stands for response evaluation criteria in solid tumors, which is a mouthful. Um, but uh, the principle of, of measuring size is you, have, you do a, a CAT scan and you measure the size at baseline, you do the treatment, and then you me measure the size on, um, after the treatment. And you can have um, different responses. Of course, you can have what we call a complete response where the tumor disappears. You can have a partial response. It's getting significantly smaller. It can look the same, meaning stable, which in advanced disease is a desirable thing. Or the worst case scenario, it can get bigger and develop additional lesions. Now you can, you also get treatment induced molecular changes. So the blue, intensity of blue here, it shows you the degree of uh, somatostatin receptor density and tracer uptake. And then on a follow-up scan after treatment, usually size and um, tracer uptake go hand in hand. The, thing get, the tumor gets smaller and you have a decrease in tracer uptake. With neuroendocrine tumors, you often also see after treatment, you see a decrease in tracer uptake, but the size looks roughly the same because it takes much longer for a tumor to actually shrink than it takes for the um, uh, molecular signal to, the, um, to respond. Now, unfortunately, sometimes tumors change and you can get a decrease in tracer uptake, but the tumor is getting bigger. So, um, as most of you probably know, neuroendocrine tumors can change and, and uh, de-differentiate to become more aggressive. So at that point, they often lose their somatostatin receptors um, and are no longer that well imaged with dotatate. At this point, we have other tracers that we can use and to become more useful. And the uh, main tracer that we use for the more aggressive neuroendocrine tumors and other cancers, I should say, is what's called FDG which is basically a form of glucose that's labeled with a radioactive isotope of fluoride and that allows us to do PET imaging. So most neuroendocrine tumors, the grade one and grade two, have very little FTG uptake. That's why they're better imaged with dotatate. Once they de-differentiate or if they're more aggressive neuroendocrine tumors, they tend to become more aggressive and also take up a lot more of the FTG as a tracer. So at this point, if you want to do treatment monitoring, the follow-up scan should then be done with FTG rather than with dotatate. And here is an, an example of a patient that had both a dotatate scan and an FTG scan. Again, this is the sugar analog. Should, um, and you can see multiple lesions in the head and neck area. Barely can see the lesions here in the abdominal area, but if you look at the FTG scan, you can see that there's a lot of glucose uptake both in the neck lesions and in the abdominal lesions, telling us that this tumor has de-differentiated, has become more aggressive, and is losing the somatostatin receptors. So uh, in summary, the dotatate binds to somatostatin receptors present in the neuroendocrine tumors. It is really the state-of-the-art imaging uh, for neuroendocrine tumors. Unfortunately, it's, uh, although it's widely used in Europe, it's not approved in the United States yet, so we can only do it in the conjunction of clinical trials. And we have such a trial ongoing at UCLA right now. Um, we've done 100 patients so far and just received approval to do an additional 300 patients. Uh, the downside is also that it's uh, not have, having been approved by the FDA is that uh, insurances don't pay for it. So patients unfortunately do have to pay for the scan, although we do everything at cost. We're not making a profit on this. Um, the, um, just to summarize, the degree of the dotatate uptake helps identify suitable candidates for the peptide radioreceptor therapy. And then for evaluating the treatment response, you can use anatomical imaging or fused imaging as well. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you.